A scripture reading today is from John chapter 4, verses 34 through 36. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good to see y'all here this morning. A couple of things I wanted to mention. We have our new Calvary magazines that came in. I just put them out uh, on the table out front. So when you come in the foyer, they're, they're on that table. Make sure you pick you up one and keep up what's going around with the, with the Calvary Association, different things happening. I uh, wanted to tell you uh, we had a great time on our outreach yesterday. Had about six families that we were able to minister to. We, some of those we were able to pray for. We fed them all. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, with the guys, we, we ate more hot dogs than we probably gave away, but that's okay. They were all well, well received. <laughs> so, um, but it was really a good time. The weather was, you know, the Lord held the weather off, and we were able to, to, uh, to go out and minister to a lot of different people. So, and really, that's what it's about. You know, we're talking about this week, our title is going to be The Harvest is Ready. And the scripture we just read just pretty much nails that. And I'm going to touch on that again at the end of the message. But, um, but the harvest is ready. And, and when we finished up last week, we saw that Jesus said the laborers are few. So we're praying for laborers. And you guys are laborers. And I thank God for each one of you that are here. I praise God that you're part of our fellowship and that you're here and those who are listening that couldn't be here, I know your, your heart is with us as well. Um, but we're praying for laborers that, that God will bring with different gifts and different talents to be able to add to not the number, but would add into the ministry itself as we go forth and do what God has called us to do. So uh, keep that in mind as, in your prayer that, that we ask God to, to do that. And that's exa- exactly what Jesus said in our message last week. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send laborers. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll open to Matthew chapter 9, we're going to pick up in verse, actually we're going to go back to verse 18, and then we're going to pick up in verse 23. Father, we ask that your spirit would um, just be with us this morning, that you would speak to our hearts and guide our paths, Lord. We don't want to be off the path. We want to be on the path. Wherever you place us, wherever you lead us, that's where we need to be. It's easy to get distracted in this world, and there's a lot of noise a lot of noise around us, Lord. And I pray that you would silence the noise and let us hear your voice and walk in obedience and listen and do what you call us to do. And we thank you that you're here with us this morning. We pray you'll open our ears to hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we covered uh, last week about the new wine, which is the new covenant, and the new wineskins, which is the church, which is you guys. And we saw how we can't go back to the old covenant and try to put it into the church. The old covenant was fulfilled when Jesus came. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the old covenant. He instituted a new covenant, and that covenant of mercy and grace. And if you you try to take the legal system and put it into the church today, it, it wreaks havoc. It brings pain and suffering because no one can live up to it. And that was really in, in part and intended for that. That's what was given. The law was given to reveal sin and to reveal that we can't live up to God's standards. And that's ultimately why Jesus came. So with legalism in the church, mercy and grace are thrown out the window. And we also saw the compassion of Jesus when, when the woman touched his garment. And he said, your faith has made you whole. And she touched his garment. Again, we remember talking about that last week because she was afraid uh, to come out publicly. Uh, She was afraid she'd be humiliated because of the the, uh, blood disorder that she had, and she was unclean. And had anyone 
saw her there without her sneaking in and touching that garment, she would have been probably rejected and thrown out of the crowd and said, you can't be here. You have to be outside the, the assembly. You can't be anywhere near us. And so she snuck in and she touched his garment. And Jesus said, who touched me? And that was, that was uh, kind of funny to his disciples. What do you mean, who touched you? All, the, all these people around you. He said, yeah, well, someone touched me because I felt part power uh, leaving me. I felt the power going from me. And, and then she came and she bowed before him, and he said, your faith has made you whole. So we see Jesus has compassion in his heart for the people. So let's go back and read Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. And then we'll pick up at verse 23. But Matthew 9, 18. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now Matthew 23 uh, picks up on this story. It says, When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, Make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report of this went out into all that land. Now Mark chapter 5, verse 41, we read it this way, Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kamai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And then we have Luke's version. In Luke chapter 8, verses 49 through 56, it says, While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep, she's not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she rose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. So we see these three uh, stories in the Gospels told, and this one's a slightly different aspect of the story. The result is the same. This man came to Jesus looking for a miracle. His daughter, in, uh, in the Matthew's version, had died or was in the, uh, about dead, and then in the Luke's version, these men came and say, don't bother him because she is already dead. But he came to Jesus. He's looking for a miracle. He's looking for for Jesus to do something that no one else can do. Jesus is the only one who can do anything. And when he came, he didn't say, I'll do what I can. He came to do what he did. His intent was to heal this girl, to raise her up before he ever got there. He went to this man's house, knowing exactly what he's going to do. And let's note, too, that this was a Jewish leader that came to Jesus. That's a rarity in the scriptures. Most of the Jewish leaders were out to kill him because they considered him to be blasphemous and they considered him to um, be from Satan. We're going to touch on that here in just a moment as well. But he was the ruler of the synagogue. And this shows us two things about this individual. Number one, he was desperate. There was no other hope. The physicians, evidently, and it doesn't talk about physicians. Maybe she died very suddenly without even seeing a physician. But if, if she had seen a physician, they couldn't do any good. Nothing was done for her, and she perished. And secondly, we also see that he was very bold. He was very bold to come to Jesus as a ruler of the synagogue because this is not something that would look good for him on his resume. And if you think about it, a lot of the Jewish leaders in that day, they were all doing what they did for religious purposes, obviously. They were doing them out of routine, but some of them were doing them so that they could climb the ladder. 
That was what, the, uh, uh, what Paul was doing or Saul was doing before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was climbing the ladder to success. He was bold. He was educated. Probably one of the most educated of his, of his day in his class. And he was, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He even said so himself. He was raising up, and he would have been probably at some point the chief ruler in, the, in that land. He would have been uh, over all the others. But the Lord had other plans for him. But most of the other rulers did not come near Jesus except to either try to entrap him, to trick him, or to try to condemn him. He was bold because he knew that this decision to follow Jesus would not set well with the other Jewish leaders. And at this point, he didn't care. Again, he was desperate. He didn't care what people thought. And ultimately, just to insert this, this is where we should be in our walk. We should not care what other people think. See, our culture is going one direction. Jesus is going the other. And if you try to say, I follow Jesus, and you say that, but then you go with the culture out of timidity, then you're not really following Jesus in boldness. You're not, uh, you're not presenting and living what you say you believe. Now, this man, I don't, it doesn't say that he believed that Jesus was, was the Son of God. It doesn't say that he believed Jesus was their Messiah. What it says here is he was desperate in the moment, and Jesus was his only hope. And he reached out and said, I know that if you will only come to my house and touch her, she will, be, she will be healed. And again, he didn't care. Why? Because his heart was broken. A brokenness is exactly where we're supposed to be. This is where believers need to be when they're seeking the Lord, from a place of brokenness. How many times do we come to the Lord as our last resort? Many times. Now, as believers, we should come to him as our first resort. We should be on our knees. At the minute something, something comes our way, Lord, I'm giving this to you now, so the number one, I won't fall into anxiety and worry over it. Number two is I know that nobody else or nothing else can really fix this problem, so I'm coming to you right up front. But most of the time, even believers, we hear the words, well, we've done all we can do. I guess it's time to pray. And that's a common, commonality in the church. It's, it's just the, the way the mind works. We're supposed to fix ourselves until we can't, and then we go to Jesus. Well, Jesus came because we couldn't fix ourselves, period. That was why he came. And he is our healer. He's our fixer. He does everything within us. So we need to come to him in this place of brokenness, in this place of recognizing he is our only hope. Otherwise, we're still hanging on to the culture that tells us we can do more than we, we're supposed to do our part than Jesus does his part. Jesus has already done his part. Our part is not to go in and add to what Jesus did or to take any self-responsibility within ourselves that we can do this or that. Our part is to say, Jesus, I recognize what you did. You came because I couldn't do anything within myself, and so therefore I cling to you in everything. I deny myself, I take up my cross, I follow you. The old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Well, in all things that are new, that means our minds are new, our hearts are new, and we're no longer trying to do things for ourselves. We gave up that right when we accepted Jesus Christ. It's all about him and what he's done and what he's going to do. And the other thing, too, we have to be careful of when we come to him if we come to him, uh, we need to either come out of desperation and boldness because we know he's there, but we don't come to him in demand. And that is another aspect that some of the church in, in, in our country in particular has kind of got off track with. They want to demand God to do this. Lord, we command you to do this. We, I don't command Jesus to do anything. I thank him that he's willing to do anything for me. And Lord, I give this to you, and I pray in Jesus' name, your will be done. I give you this situation. May you do what you have to do. I pray for complete and total fix, but sometimes God answers our prayers in ways that we don't understand. And sometimes he doesn't give us a yes, he gives us a no, or he gives us 
I'm doing it, but you're going to have to wait because I've still got things to do over here. I'm still working it out. Walk in faith. Don't give up hope. But what is the attitude of our heart when we come to Jesus? Jesus told the man, do not be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Another aspect of the human nature. When, a, when that wall comes at us or the wave or whatever's in front of us, we tend to get anxious and tend to get fearful of the circumstance. Well, Jesus rose above all of our circumstances when he rose again. There's no circumstance that we're under. Well, under the circumstances, no, we're above them. And we're supposed to remain above him in faith. When God made a promise to Abraham, and we read in Genesis 15, 6, he said, Abraham believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. God accounted it to Abraham as righteousness because he believed what was told to him. This was going to happen. You're going to have a son. You're going to be the father of many nations through that bloodline. And all of this came to pass, and he believed. See, believing in God pleases him. It pleases God when we believe in him. Non-belief does not please God. And he's, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Well, we can't have faith unless we believe. So we have belief, we have faith, then we please him. It says, For he who comes to God first must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He rewards those who are seeking him. And what does the scripture say? Draw near to God. He draw, draws near to you. That's a reward within itself. That is the most, uh, the, the biggest award we can actually grab is to know that when we are believing in him and we're seeking him, we're walking in faith. Number one, it pleases him. And number two, he rewards us because of our faith. He gives us more of himself. And James tells us to pray believing. In James 1, 5 through 8, he says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Now, we know he's speaking of wisdom here, but it comes in faith in general. When we come to God, we need to come believing in faith that he hears our prayers, that he answers our prayers. And we believe, we walk in faith, and he rewards those who diligently seek him. So what is the attitude of our heart when we make our supplications to the Lord? How do we come to him? Well, we have the model prayer that Jesus gave us a few chapters back. When we come, we're to come hallowing the Father. Father, hallowed be your name. We praise you. We worship you. We come to God with an attitude of praise and worship. That's the first thing that we're supposed to do. Because if we come to him right off the bat out of fear and anxiety and throwing our supplications, we're not walking in faith in our prayer. Because we need to come to God and we need to praise him we need to worship him for who he is. That's showing him that we believe in him. That's showing us that and showing him that we are there to seek him diligently. So we praise him. We worship him. And that's really what our worship team is all about before the service starts. They're not really doing anything except bringing us into the heart and the mindset of worship. But we are actually worshiping before we ever come. This is just a part of worship. We call it worship. Yeah, worship and teaching. But ultimately, we're still in the place of worship right now. Why? Because we're honoring God. We're giving praise to the Father. We're giving praise to Jesus. We're welcoming the Holy Spirit. We're acknowledging His presence. We're acknowledging our need for Him. That's the heart of worship. No matter you're singing or sitting or driving or working, wherever you are, the heart is what worship is all about. And so we're in that place of worship wherever we are if we're keeping our eyes on Jesus, if we're trusting Him. When we're not, we're not worshiping. 
And true worship is an attitude of the heart. So that is the, one of our questions this morning. And what is the attitude of our heart when we make our supplications before the Lord? Do we just come in with the list? We go through it, boom, 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 and we get up and go? Or do we say, Lord, I just want to take some time and I want to be in your presence. I want to thank you. Now, I want to tell you something. Your flesh is going to fight against that very hard because the flesh feels what it feels. It wants what it wants. It demands what it demands. And the spirit and the flesh wrestle against one another. That's what the scripture tells us. And so when you come and you have a heavy heart and you're broken over something, whether it's a, a person, a relationship, whether it's finances, whether it's your health, whether, whatever it might be, when you come, if the attitude is more about you than it is about him, that's not diligently seeking him. That's just pouring out and dumping and running. There's a place for dumping. Don't get me wrong. We dump everything at the altar. But we need to come with an attitude of praise and worship and, and, and have our heart in that mindset. And again, it's not going to be easy. It, it, it takes, you have, to, you have to work at it. You have to work at coming to the Lord and putting yourself aside and worshiping him first. But it's something that we need to do. And we all need to examine the attitude of our heart. Now back to our text. We see that Jesus comes into the house. And he sees the mourners wailing noisily. They're very loud. Jesus said, don't weep. Because she's not dead, but she's sleeping. And they, their mourning quickly turned to ridicule. And that tells us a little bit about this group, doesn't it? And we have to understand, too, that in their culture, mourners were often hired to come in to the funeral services or the memorials or whatever it might be. And it, it, I, don't, I don't understand that culture because I couldn't see anybody paying somebody to come and cry over a loved one, but that's what they would do in that culture. Now, there could have been some of those there. Uh, whatever the case, it doesn't look like they're very sincere because they turn from mourning to laughter and ridicule very quickly, just over a simple word. Don't, you know, don't be doing that. She's not dead, she's just sleeping. So they, they ridicule him. But notice how Jesus is not phased by that. I love that about this whole passage. Jesus doesn't get all defensive. He doesn't have to defend himself. He spoke what he spoke. And what he spoke was true. But they couldn't comprehend it. He didn't sit there and debate with them. He didn't sit there and argue with them. He didn't even belittle them. He just put them out. Out you go. And again, that shows us his authority in what he does. Jesus, he's perfect in balance in everything that he does. And if he does raise his voice, if he does elevate the activity of, of doing something, he does it in the proper and the right authority to do so. And here, out you go, out they went. And they're all outside now. And he comes back in, and he does what he came to do. <laughs> And while Jesus shows his compassion, again, he also shows his authority. He cleared the room, showing that he was in charge, and he got rid of the distractions. He got rid of the distractions. Maybe, in our hearts and minds today, we need to be clear to the distractions that surround us when we pray. And there are many. First, don't ever try to pray if the news is on. You'll just be more mad than anything else. But you need to get in a quiet place, and you need to turn the distractions off. And you need to actually, when you're in your place, and you're praising and you're worshiping, you're actually dealing with the fear, you're dealing with the doubt, and you're dealing with the anxiety by pushing it away and saying, no, I'm not going to let you have dominance here. I'm going to now worship my God. I'm going to be here, and I'm going to put away this noise. And we all have it. Our own flesh our own fears, our own anxieties, the noise that is around us. And then also, we have to be careful who we call and share with because you can also get a lot of noise from other people. Now, we are, as a church, called to minister to one another. But I encourage you this morning, don't call somebody who is not walking with the Lord. Because they're not going to give you godly advice or godly counsel. 
Share with those that you trust are walking with the Lord. Otherwise, you will get a lot of bad counsel. Job understood this. Number one, Job didn't ask his friends to come. They just showed up when he was in his grief. And after all their banner, back and forth, back and forth, and they were all pointing out how he had to be in sin. They were all saying this was all his fault, all this stuff. Job 16, 2 says, I've heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. <laughs> he recognized that they weren't helping the situation. <laughs> and, this, and us too, we need to be careful about that because, you know, the Lord is dealing with us on something. We need to go to those who are going to pray for us, those who are going to encourage us, those who are not going to condemn just because something's going on in our lives that maybe the Lord's given them a word of knowledge or word information that they need to share, but if that's done and it's a, a word of correction, it's done in love. It's done in gentleness. That's the appropriate way to handle it, but not to come in and abuse people. That's noise. That's just noise, and it's distractions in people's lives. So in our time of desperation, let us get alone. Let us get quiet as we ask as we seek, as we knock. But as we're doing those things, we're also listening and we're waiting. We're listening and we're waiting. We're asking God for, uh, for these things, but at the same time we're saying, but Lord, now I want to take a minute and I just want to sit quietly before you. And many times God will deal directly to our heart and give us a word that we needed from Him. It, it's probably going to be a scripture that he'll remind you of. But it may be just a still, small voice. Just like the prophet who was running from Jezebel. He was hiding in the cave. After he had just went and killed 400 prophets of Baal, he's now running from a woman that says, I'm going to have your head on a platter. So he's in the cave, and God shows up. And he comes. And he calls into the front of the cave, but then... What happens? All these things come. And he said, God wasn't in the fire. God wasn't in the whirlwind. God wasn't in the earthquake. But then, there was a still, small voice. And that's what the prophet heard. And that's when they had their conversation. And see, the thing is, is that when he came, he was not coming in real truth. The prophet was, and he was coming, and he was saying, I'm the only one left. You've used me, and I know you've used me, but I'm all by myself now. I don't want to be all by myself. I just want to be dead. I don't want to be involved in all this anymore. And God said, no, there's, I've got 7,000 reserved right over here. You're not alone. And let me encourage you all this morning, too. You're not alone. There are many that God has set aside specifically to help, to, to pray. And there are many praying for you that you don't even know about. And God is using them, and he's, he's preparing you by other people praying and being involved and doing things, and he's raising them up to do so. But we're not alone, and that is a place that so many times we feel like we come to. We're, we're all by ourselves. There's just there's nothing happening. I'm going to confess to you, this week, I had a couple of moments like that where I felt like nothing was right in my life. It was all upside down. I couldn't see clearly. I had noise. I had issues in my mind and in my heart. And I had to lay all that down. And it took a couple of days to do it. it could, I mean, it was not an easy time. You ever want to quit? There are times your pastor feels like he wants to quit. And I praise God it's not an ongoing thing every day, every moment. It's not. So don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not resigning this morning <laughs> to, the, to those who might be depressed about that. <laughs> but at the same time, we all go through those moments. We're all human. We have those human those human moments, those, those times where we just feel like we've done all we're supposed to do. Somebody else needs to pick it up and run with it. I don't have anything else to give. And then we feel like nothing's happening. I'm not seeing this. I'm not seeing that. And I have those moments. We all do. And, and, and a word was spoken to me this morning that I just really appreciate. The Lord sees. 
the Lord sees. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going on in here. He knows what's going on in each of you. He knows what's going on in this community. He knows what he's doing. And as we're praying for this community, he is not silent. He's moving. He may not be moving the way we have expected or wanted or desired. He may not have this room packed out with people on their knees serving and worshiping him. But the, the truth of the matter is, is that you're here. And those who are listening online that can't be here, they're in unity with us in spirit. There's things happening. And then we had a wonderful time yesterday ministering to six families that came up, praying for some. And it was a real blessing. It was a real blessing. This, first, this one Hispanic family came up. It was, it was a mother and about three or four kids. And, and they came up, and we had the free hot dog sign. They'd already eaten, but, you know, kids, and, you know, they're going to want to eat. Well, anyway, they came over, and before we even got started to get our food together, they said, the kids said, can we pray first? And so we, we sat down, and, and they prayed. One of the little boys prayed for us. And then another one chimed in and prayed a little bit. And then we gave them some food and everything, and then not about... 30 minutes later, the kids come back and they, they pull Jennifer aside and they say, hey, can you pray for us? We, we fight too much. Or we, we, need to, we need to pray pray that we get along. And then another, another family comes and I may, we're able to pray for them. They're, they're, they're little girls in preschool and they're really concerned about the school systems and everything going on with the COVID and all this other stuff. We were able to pray for that family. And then a man came up, and he, his wife wasn't with him at the time, but she's going in for surgery this week. He said, hey, I saw your sign. Uh, you know, can you pray for my wife? And so we bowed our heads and prayed for her right then, right there. And she came up later and thanked us, and he took some hot dogs. And it was just, it was a good day. And it was a blessing to see. It wasn't masses coming. Matter of fact, we had to go find them. Because the park wasn't packed with people yesterday. It was when I got there. When we first got there, there was a road race going. That I didn't even know what was going on yesterday. And the finish line was in, that, in, the, in the park in, inside the, the track. And so they were still coming in while I was setting up. But by the time we really got started with the men's thing, we did our men's meeting outside out there. The park. That was also a blessing. We studied the Word right there in a circle and, and had the Bibles open. And we were, we were worshiping. We were praying. And we were studying. But by the time we were done, everybody had pretty much cleared out. There were just a few families that were coming and going. No other activities in the park. So Jennifer went down to the, to the playground and talked to a few people. I went down to the basketball court and another playground. We talked to a few people, and they would come. And so as they would come, we ministered. And it was a blessing. And so God is moving. He's doing a work. And we're part of that work. So... In our prayer time, when we come and we feel like we've just got this wave of depression or desperation, this wave of, of aching, this wave of, of, of basically just feeling completely useless. And all of us get that way from time to time. The Lord says, hey, you're not. Because I am in you. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The world has no place to bring condemnation to me. The world has no place to bring fear and anxiety to me. I have Jesus. I have the Holy Spirit. And we have his word. So let's, let's keep that in mind as we're, as we're getting alone and quiet. Block out those noises. And sometimes it's good to put on some soft worship music in the background. I, I try to do that when I do my studies too. Now I, I'll be honest with you, I can't put contemporary Christian music on in my background when I'm when I'm trying to study, it's more noise to me because it's very repetitive and you get yourself off on a line that they say over and over and over again. The next thing you know, you're distracted from the study. So I just do piano worship music, <laughs> but I'm not telling you what to do. If that work ministers to you, go for it. But that's for me. But I do try to do that when I'm doing my studies, particularly. In verses seven, uh, 27 through 34, when Jesus departed from there, Two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. Again, this is a confirmation, same thing he, he said, Your faith, do not fear to the other gentleman, do not fear, just believe. 
And that's what he's telling him. Their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out demons by the ruler of demons. Now again, here we see the compassion of Jesus. He heals those that are brought to him. But the Pharisees claim he's casting out demons by, by the chief demons. And this is not the only time they did this. Later in Matthew, in chapter 12, they say the same thing. Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Ooh, he turned that right around, didn't he? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Now, this is a powerful statement because Jesus is telling them that the kingdom of God has come upon them. The kingdom of God has come upon you. This is verse 28 of what we just read. They didn't see it. They couldn't see the kingdom of God in front of them. They're calling Jesus an operative of Satan. Their own Messiah of whom they have denied and who they missed, they call him an operative of Satan. Their hearts were so hard and so cold that they couldn't see what was going on around them. Now, and the next thing that Jesus said that was very interesting, when we read Matthew 12, 31, it says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven, forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. So, honestly, if you look in context, this passage was put after the Pharisees said that he was casting out demons by Satan. That was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we read up here, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God was with, the, with him. The Spirit of God was doing the work. Jesus spoke it. It happened. They were then now putting, now yeah, they were speaking against Jesus, and he said, that can be forgiven, but I'm telling you, you speak against the Holy Spirit, you blaspheme against him, it will not be forgiven, not here nor later. We need to be very careful, very careful that we don't find ourselves seeing the work of God and saying it's from Satan. When Jesus was empowered by the Spirit, when Jesus said that he was casting out demons by the power of Satan, they weren't only blaspheming against him, but the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at that more when we get into chapter 12. Uh, so I'm not going not to belabor that point this morning. Verses 35 through 38. When Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus sees the weary sheep. He sees them. He knows they're struggling. He knows they're wandering without a shepherd. And when Jesus sent out his disciples, it was an extension of himself. And it's today the same way. The church sends out because Jesus came. Jesus 
instituted the new covenant. He implemented it. He now sustains it. The new covenant is the church. It's the new wineskin that holds the new covenant. And so as we go forth, we're going in an extension of Jesus. We're supposed to let his light shine through us. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He then said, you're the light of the world. And we're not to cover that light with the worldly things, with, with the things of the world. It dims our light. When we're not believing, when we're not trusting, when we're not seeking, our light is dim. And Jesus said we're to let that light shine. And he sees all of these people in his compassion, his heart is moved for them. He knows that the church now has got to get out and do the work. He's preparing it. And the church hadn't been implemented just yet. Because Jesus hadn't died and rose again. And we haven't seen in the book of Acts where the church was actually born. But these are the founders of the church that he's speaking with, his disciples. These are the ones he's sending out even now. And he even sent out by twos in a couple of other places. We will read. He said, yeah, send them out by twos. And they would go out. And so what he's saying here is he's saying we need more people to send out. We need more laborers. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers because it's his harvest. That's another thing we as churches need to grab a hold of. Pastors, teachers, leaders, people in the church. It's his harvest, not ours. And if I find that, that I can share today, we may be ones that are sowing and hear later that someone actually received that word, but they didn't come back here. That's still a blessing. And that happened not too long ago. A, a gentleman that, uh, that I used to do a lot of business with in town, he came to visit our church back uh, when we were in the, in the um, school building. And he wasn't a believer. He came. I don't know if at that day that the word was spoken and he received a seed. I don't know. I'm sure, the seed, I'm sure it was. Whether that's the seed that grew or not, I don't know. But I find out just not too long ago and several months ago that he actually did receive the Lord, got baptized, and is now a member of a local church down the road. Am I upset that he's not here? No. I'm going to see him forever. So it doesn't matter where he goes as long as he's going to a Bible teaching church and he's growing in the Lord. And that's the attitude that we need to have. And that goes back to the... To the uh, scripture reading we had this morning at the end of that passage if you remember what it said it said you know whether you're the sower or whether you're the reaper you are getting a reward you will be rewarded for your obedience so are we sowers are we reapers I'd like to say we're both but I want to be where God wants us to be and be obedient. And if we're just do, uh, if all we're going to do is sow, then we need to be content with we may not see the fruit. And that is something that as believers we have to really grab a hold of because many times we're fruit oriented. If we don't see the church full, if we don't see this happening, we don't see that happening, then the church is dying. The church is not doing what it's supposed to do. Well, I can tell you, God can do a wonderful work with a small group of people probably more than he can do with a massive church that's all about open doors and not teaching God's word. If you're not teaching God's word, there's nothing that's going to be effective in a big church except the good social gathering. And that's where churches are a lot of times today. We're not about a social gathering. Oh, we have our fellowship together, and I love our fellowship times. We have some great times together, and those times are encouraging. And they should be. That's what we do. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. But that's not the main purpose. The main purpose is that we come together, we worship in unity, we learn together, we study together, then we apply together, and God will take each one and put him where he needs or she needs to be to do what he's called them to do. That's the church. You individually are the church. We're here together corporately. And there are many others meeting today doing the same thing. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. 
and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Speaking of Jesus. And Jesus is looking at the multitudes here. He knows that Isaiah's words are about to be fulfilled. At this point, Jesus is still healing. He's still teaching. He's still going from place to place, city to city, town to town, ministering to people, feeding them, healing them, preaching to them, teaching to them. But shortly, because Jesus' world ministry wasn't all that long, he was 33, we pretty much based on information that we've gathered. His actual ministry was about three years. And in that three years is what we're, what we're reading about and studying here. But he sees this multitude. He has compassion. And he has compassion about where they are right now. See, Jesus is confer- concerned for those he's going to the cross for. He hadn't taken on their sin yet, but he knew he would. He always knew the Father's plan. He was always walking in the Father's plan. He was always obedient to the Father's plan. And he's looking at these people, and I could, I mean, I can't imagine, because obviously I don't have the, the, the mindset that he had being God and man, but to look at these people and know, I'm going to be dying for you and 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 everyone. I'm going to fulfill the Father's plan for you. He knows their loss, but he sees them as the harvest. And this is now how we're to see the lost. Yes, they're in sin. But many in the multitude are ripe and ready to be harvested. The problem that a lot of times we have is we can't tell ripe fruit from rotten fruit. Because as they're all in sin, it still looks kind of rotten, doesn't it? As we were sinners, and and we were rotten fruit hanging too. But Jesus saw that we were part of the harvest. And so we have to be careful that when we are sent and we're out in the world, that we're not causing other people in the world to feel like they're rotten fruit, even though they may be. We don't know whose heart is being nudged for the Lord. We don't know where they are in their life. We don't know what's going on in their life. We see their actions, but if you really think about it, people's actions in the world are just acting out out of anger, out of fear, out of hurt, of all the things that they've they've experienced in their life. We've all experienced the same things. We too were walking in anger and rebellion against God. But somewhere, somewhere along the line, the word was spoken and the Holy Spirit pricked our hearts. We received that word. We received Jesus as our Savior and then we receive him as our Lord. And now we're walking that relationship out. But none of us, honestly, would want to stand up. We can stand up and tell part of our testimony. But we have to clean it up for the crowd. We can't tell every detail of our past and where we came from. That's not what we're supposed to do. But we can say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was in the dirtiest place you can be, and God pulled me out of it. I used to be there. I am now here. Those are, that's our testimony. And you can plug in the blanks for each one of us because each place is, was a dirty place. Now, to some... They may say, well, that was a dirtier place than mine. Not to God, it wasn't. So the worst of the sinners, Jesus is looking at all of them, and he sees a harvest. And he says, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. We need need to be the laborers. Jesus is telling the disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest for laborers. Well, Sometimes what that means is he stirs the heart of the people that are already here. Sometimes it means he brings other people. Sometimes he's doing things that we don't see doing, but he's still doing it because we're praying. We need to be praying for it, and then we need to have our hearts open and willing to say, I want to be one of those laborers if I haven't been. I'm not trying to put anything on anybody because our core people do. It's amazing what all you guys do for being such a small church. God has used this little church in so many ways. 
and to know that this streaming service that, that Norman has really researched and helped put together and all this stuff that we're sending out, there's people all over the world that's hearing these messages. And I'm not saying they're coming in millions listening, but it's reaching out. We see all the time people from Africa, people from India, Philippines. I think last week was the Philippines we, heard, we saw some people watching on. So we know people are, are watching, and word is going out. The seeds are being sown. So that's one avenue. But the other avenue is, hey, I'm so-and-so. Do you know Jesus? And whatever God lays on your heart, but we need to pray for more laborers. And I'm asking that we as the church ask and pray for laborers to come alongside of us and go to the harvest. We need to pray specifically for laborers who have talents, gifts, and desires to partner with us, to reach out into this community as God leads us to do so. And again, we're small in number, but God provides the increase, not us. God does the work, not us. And we need to be diligent in our prayers, specifically asking for him to send us the laborers. There's a story in 1 Kings chapter 17. It's about a woman who, uh, who, had, who was running out of supplies. She was running out of flour and oil. And she couldn't survive without it. Didn't have any money to buy any. And that's to summarize the introduction here. But in 1 Kings 17, 13 through 16, it says, And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterwards make some for yourself and your son. Now this was a huge step of faith. She only had enough flour and oil to make a very, very small amount, which probably would have been one more meal. Two more meals at the most. And, and what, is, what does Elijah say? Go and make me a cake. <laughs> then make one for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the Lord sends rain on the earth. Now that was a miracle for this, for this woman. It was a miracle. She knew that she couldn't feed her son. She couldn't feed herself. Elijah said, you do what I'm telling you to do, and your flour bin will stay full. And your oil will stay full. And you will have all that you need until we have rain, because they were in a drought during that time. Mm -hmm. Things weren't growing. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not raised up, nor or used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. And you say, well, what has that got to do with our message this morning? It has this to do, that when you come to the Lord with your talents, with your gifts, with your abilities, whatever, you give them to the Lord first, then he will give them back in a such a supply that they'll never run dry. He will use you as long as you're submitted to him. And you can look at, uh, you know, we've talked about, the, well, we even looked at it last week in the, in the uh, new wineskin. You know, you think, well, if God is continuing to pour in new wine into the wineskins, don't they eventually just burst? They would if they're not being poured out in accordance to the will of God. But we're not being poured in so that we can hoard it. We're being poured in so that we pour out. And the more we pour out, the more he pours in. And it never ends. We will always have the flour and the oil. We will always have the new wine. We will always have Jesus. We will always have his word. We will always have his spirit. We will all ha always have everything that we need in order to fulfill what he's calling us to do. And the first thing to remember in this is it's not us doing it. We're just an empty vessel saying, fill me, O God. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your word. Fill me with what you want me to do. Let me go out and pour that out upon the masses, upon the harvest, and let the harvest see what you've done in my life. And then as we do that, he fills us up again and sends us out again. And the only time, the only time we find ourselves empty is when we find ourselves self-absorbed and put ourselves back in the, in the wine 
container and we got more of us than we got of him. You can't fill the vessel with flesh and spirit. The flesh has got to go. Then the spirit can do the work. And then you find yourselves doing what he called you to do. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to have moments like I had this week. I'm not telling you that there are not going to be times like that. But those times were flesh. That wasn't the Spirit of God that told me I needed to quit. That wasn't the Spirit of God that said nothing's right in your life. That was me looking at the natural, me looking at the world, me looking at the circumstances, all of these things. And God said, now, are you done? Get over yourself. Empty of that. Let me pour more in, and I'm going to fill you up. And then what does he do? He puts us together. We go out. We have a great outreach. We have a great men's group. We're, we're, we're starting some new stuff. Or should I say he started some new stuff in us. And, you know, we, we only have two Wednesdays that we do Bible study. And we just last week implemented our prayer night again. Well, now we're going to take the first, Monday, or the first Wednesday of the month and we're going to have a praise and worship night starting the first Wednesday of next month, which is not next week, by the way. I, always, I have to think these things out loud to myself to remember them. Because otherwise we'll all show up for praise and worship and, and have all, everything all set up for the night. No, this Bible study night. It gets confusing when you go second and fourth, first and third, because people start thinking every other, and then you get that fifth Wednesday. And it's all because of the fifth Wednesday everything falls apart. <laughs> Jack and I go back and forth on that all the time. But everybody gets confused. Which Wednesday is it? Well, we're going to probably get our calendar back out now that we're filling it all up again. Uh, I think I got enough COVID signs. I'm taking the one out of the four-year out, and we'll get our calendar going again. And if, as far as I'm concerned, I want to get rid of the COVID stuff altogether, but we can't just yet. But I'll just leave that one alone. But let's keep in mind as we seek the Lord that the harvest is ready. And we are some of the laborers but we need to be praying for more. And as God sends them, we all work together. When we come to God with the same heart and the same mind in unity, that's when things happen. If we come with agendas and we come with our own plans, that's when things fall apart. We've got to lay all that down. Say, okay, Lord, if it's something brand new, let's do it. If it's something that you want us to do that we've done before, then let's do it. Whatever you want, that's what we want to be a part of. Because we want to be a part of sowing into the harvest and Lord willing reaping into that harvest. But whatever he calls us to do, let's say, yes, Lord, here am I. Send me. So, Father, we come this morning thanking you for your word, thanking you for your truth, thanking you, word, uh, thank you Lord, for your spirit. Lord, I thank you for again for each person that you brought to us. And I pray for those that, that have left, Lord. I, I, I just pray blessings over them. I pray your spirit would touch them and lead them wherever you have for them to do, wherever you have for them to go, Lord. I ask that you would just minister to each person that has come through these doors, whether they're still with us, whether they just came once, or whether, Lord, they're here today. We're all part of a bigger picture than ourselves. We're, bigger, we're part of a bigger picture than this building. But we want to be available. So we commit to you today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we are the laborers. Send us more. Put us on the path you want us on. And let us follow and let us do what you called us to do. That's all we're called to do. And let us go out in joy and in peace. Let us go out, Lord, bringing in the sheaves, as the, as the old song used to say, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We lift up the name of Jesus and we glorify the name of Jesus and we, we come with full hearts this morning loving you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.